So now back to our original uh, circuit example. You know the simple, uh, you know, two-switch uh, commutation that we have here. Um, let's see what how we stand with respect to uh, the corner frequency and the um, the Q factor. Okay. So here we have the switching frequency is, is 100 kilohertz. Uh, for the, the simulation waveforms are going to be done with a duty cycle of 0.5, right? Uh, the corner frequency F0 is 5 kilohertz. Notice that this is far below uh, FS. So FS frequency is much greater than F0. And the Q factor is uh, you, know, a l you know, a little bit higher than, than 1. But it makes actually little difference because as long as FS is much higher than F0, this is simply going to work like a low-pass network that is going to filter out all harmonics, including the fundamental uh, from F sub S. And so what do we expect to see here? So this is going to be a pulsating waveform, as we said before. What do we expect to see at the output? At the output, we expect to see basically a DC voltage with some small residual ripple around it. And what do we expect to see uh, you know, for the inductor current? Well, we expect to see the triangular wave shape that you have, you know, you're so familiar with from, um, uh, from the uh, you know, introductory power trunks class. Uh, the average value of that, uh, you know, we can find by inspection. Duty cycle is about 0.5. Uh, you know, if the input voltage is 200 volts, we expect the output to be about uh, half of that, so approximately 100 volts of output. Uh, we have a 5 volt ohm, uh, 5 ohm uh, load, which means that the, the current going through the load is going to be about 20 amps. That is going to be approximately the average value of the uh, inductor current. And around that, we're going to have a ripple that depends on how large this L, you know, the inductor actually, inductance actually is here. And so you run simulation of this and, and you get something that you're totally not surprised by. Um, so let me you know, walk through these because we're going to you know, view the same set of simulation results as we start changing this circuit into you know, more soft switching like uh, behavior. Uh, let's see what is what here. Um, so the f starting from the bottom, uh, the bottom waveforms are uh, the gate drive waveform for the top switch. Okay, so this V of G1S, that's uh, that's the uh, the um, the waveform that is driving the upper switch. That's the gate drive waveform. The V of G2 is the um, bottom switch, bottom MOSFET gate drive waveform. Uh, they are approximately 50% duty cycle type waveforms, but notice that they are non-overlapping. First, we turn off uh, you know, the MOSFET M1, the one on top. Then, we turn on the MOSFET at the bottom. And vice versa, at, uh, you know, as we go to the other transition, we turn off MOSFET M2, then we turn on MOSFET M1, and so on. So there is a you know, dead time, small gap between the conduction of the two devices, because of course we cannot afford to, um, um, to um, why am I not able to do this, let's see, okay, we cannot afford to uh, turn both of these FETs on at the same time, of course. Now, so those are the gate drive waveforms. The V sub S, is the switch node voltage, you know, pulsating waveform, very easily understood, and it goes from about zero to about 200 volts, steps back, and so on, repeats in time. Inductor current, no big surprises. Uh, notice the, the output voltage is a little less than 100 volts because these waveforms are not exactly you know, giving 50% duty cycle, uh, and so the, uh, the output current is a little less than 20 amps, but again, no big surprises there. A triangular waveform for the inductor current and a output voltage waveform that looks like basically DC. At this scale, you can't even tell there is any uh, you know, remaining uh, ripple in the output voltage. Everything is you know, straightforward from 
your introductory class. Then this current here, this Ix of U1 current, that's the current that is feeding right here. So that current is one that we're going to pay some attention to. Uh, so this current here is what we would call I of U1. That's the current that's basically just going through the upper switch. When you say U1, it's actually a combination of the MOSFET, M1, and uh, the, the, the anti parallel diode D1. So a combination of these two is what is called U1. The diodes are explicitly shown here because I want to discuss the details of how these transitions actually occur. But normally for a MOSFET this would be a body diode of the, of the, of the MOSFET. So built into the device that you can't you can take out. Um, all right? So this current here uh, is the current that is going through the device and then the top waveform uh, are the instantaneous power losses on the two devices. So here is uh, P of U1, that's this, it's the product of the voltage and the current through the device U1, and then P of U2 is the product of instantaneous voltage and current on the device U2. Uh, and, and these last two waveforms is where we have a, a motivation to move forward with this, uh, because you know most of the time you don't you don't see anything uh, you know in this power waveforms, which is certainly desirable. You don't want to see any product of voltage and current across the switch, right? That's the the premise of power electronics is that the product is zero, um, and and any anything that's away from that is certainly a cause of, of disturbance. In this particular case, you see that we have major cause of disturbance right here, uh, or you know, major reason to be concerned about this circuit here is these large spikes of instantaneous power dissipation on, um, you know, it's a blue, it's a device U1. So U1 device exhibits this, you know, large peaks of instantaneous power dissipation at a time when what happens? This is at a time when um, the VS um, voltage is um, this is at a time when the VS voltage is going up, which means um, this is the time when we are turning the MOSFET M1 on. We are trying to pull the voltage of the switch node uh, up. Now, where is this coming from? You can trace that back to the spike of current um, in the U1 uh, device. U1 current actually shows a normal behavior of pulsating current except for this large spike of current at a time when M1 is actually turned on. So that's what we want to look into to more detail. Um, and you know, just to give you a perspective on scale, you know, what, what is the output power in this case? You know, output power is is about 100 volts times about 20 amps. It's about two kilowatts of output power. All right. Uh, now these spikes, the instantaneous power dissipations are, are several tens of kilowatts. Okay. Now fortunately they are very short, but they are large in magnitude. And so when you integrate those over a period, they are going to produce substantial or significant amount of what is normally referred to as a switching loss. 